Hi. Do you like blood tests? I hate them. You first have to show up about an hour before your appointment time at a lab. You sit in a chair and you wait for to be called in. And after you waited about an hour, the nurse calls you and she sticks a needle in your arm. And I'll confess I don't like those needles. And she draws a vial of blood. Then she draws a second one and a third one, all for a routine blood test. And that's not just the end of the pain. About uh, You wait about three weeks to get the results. And you might get them, you might not get them. And then about six weeks later, you get a bill in the mail for $1,500 for a blood test. And you're saying there must be a better way of doing things. And maybe that's at the core of the story I'm going to tell you. It's a story of a 19-year-old at Stanford, 19-year-old named Elizabeth Holmes, who dropped out of Stanford. That's pretty impressive, to drop out of the most selective school in the country, perhaps in the world. Drops out of Stanford because during the course of some summer work at a lab testing blood for SARS, she said there must be a better way of doing this. And she th thought she'd found a technology that would allow her to run all the tests on one drop of blood, not two vials, but one drop of blood, which could be taken without a syringe. You're impressed, right? And lots of people were. It was a great, great sounding story. Great sounding story, not just in terms of the product that it was producing, but in terms of who'd founded the company, how it was built up. And people picked up on it. People in from all from all perspectives. She was able to get her old professor to come work for her. That's pretty impressive. Somebody from Stanford will come and work for a student. She was able to get big names attached to a product. The Cleveland Clinic. One of the most reputable names in healthcare said that they were thinking about using the Theranos drug test. And at the other end of the spectrum, you had company, you know, you had companies like Walgreens saying they were interested as well. And finally, venture capitalists came running along. They said, this is a great story. We've got to attach a price to the story. And as late as August of this year, Theranos' value was estimated around $9 billion. Estimate in what sense? That's what venture capitalists seem to be pricing the company at based on how much they were asking for their investments in the company. The company had made it. a great story with a great ending, right? The story started to come apart a couple of weeks ago when the Wall Street Journal reported that this, this drop of blood that supposedly could run 30 tests and do it all quickly and get it to you on a computer and be much lower cost than the old one had one problem. It wasn't working. It wasn't working in the sense the company itself wasn't using this test to run blood tests on customers. It was using a more conventional test. The FDA came out a week later and said, you, you know what, the, the, it's, uh, we're not going to give it permission for more than one out of the 30 tests. The herpes was, I think, the herpes test was the only one that they okayed. The rest, they said, they had issues with both the company's record keeping on tests and product reliability. And the big names that had attached themselves to the company started disassociating from the company. So the Cleveland Clinic said, no, we're really not that interested. Walgreens said, hey, we're cutting ties with Theranos. So the story started to come apart. Now, the initial reaction that Theranos had was to fight back. They said the stories are wrong. The Wall Street Journal didn't quite get the truth. And go into a secrecy mode, which is the mode that the company's operated in through its entire life. This is a very Silicon Valley thing to do is when in trouble, shut all the barriers, make sure nothing comes out of the firm. That might work with some products, but if your product is a blood test that has to get FDA approval, and the scientists have to oversee what you're doing, this isn't going to work. So eventually, Ms. Holmes came out and she said, the data is the data, we have to release it. So she's promised to be more transparent. Now, whether this will save Theranos or not, we'll come back to. But I decided it might make sense to look at the Theranos story to ask, what is it about this story that led so many bright people to jump on the bandwagon without asking fundamental questions? And as I see it, and I might be a little unfair, and you could argue maybe even a little sexist in some of these critiques, and if that is the case, you know, I'm sorry. But there are three issues that I have with the Terrano story that I think might be red flags I would use on the next big story that's told to me. The first is the phenomenon of what I call the runaway story, a story that's so good that you don't want to ask any questions that might make it not good. So in a sense, it's like a fairy tale playing out. And in a fairy tale, who wants to get up and say the princess is not really the princess or the prince is really not the prince? So the story was so good that nobody wanted to ask the question. It's a little bit like the emperor's new clothes, right? You're getting benefits. Nobody wants to ask those tough questions. The second, and this is the petty part of me speaking up, 
One of the things that set Miss Holmes apart was the fact that she always wore the same thing to everything, to big events, small events, to interviews, run the business, a black turtleneck. In fact, she's boasted about the fact that she has 150 of these black turtlenecks. He's saying, so what? Let her wear whatever she wants. I have no problem with that black, with the turtleneck. In fact, if it had been a red turtleneck or a blue turtleneck or a pink turtleneck, I might have been okay with it. But the black turtleneck, for better or worse, drew Steve Jobs comparisons. You know what I'm talking about, where people look and say, oh, you're the next Steve Jobs. And whether it's fair or not to Miss Holmes, that seemed to be the impression she left at a lot of places, that she was the female version of a Steve Jobs, focused, missionary-like, wanting to save the world and and save the way it was, you know, save the way healthcare was done. And I think that 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 cuts to the heart of stories. To me, a story has to be measured by who's telling the story and whether they're being authentic. And authentic means you've got to be yourself. And I don't see how you can be yourself and then dress up like somebody else. Now, Ms. Holmes, in her defense, says that Steve Jobs was not the model for the black turtlenecks. It was Sharon Stone, and maybe that's true. She also says that she likes black turtlenecks because it means she can spend less time each morning picking clothes. In fact, Ms. Holmes is almost like a missionary in the way she describes herself in the company, and that's a little scary. And thirdly, thirdly, there's a governance issue. I've never understood why VCs let these small companies govern themselves the way they do, at least some young companies. I think that in some cases you could argue it's because the founder owns the company. He's not going to do something stupid. In other cases, you could argue that maybe the VC is a management advisor to the company. But in the Theranos case, I think the governance problem was run, ran amok. And to explain it, let me give you, show you the board of directors for Theranos. Take a look at this list. First, it's very old. My first reaction when I saw this list was, really? He's still alive? Really? He's still alive too? You have two 90-year-olds, Henry Kissinger and George Schultz, on this list. Illustrious names. But do they really... Are they really going to ask you tough questions that keep you on your toes about the FDA process? In fact, my first reaction when I saw this list, and this might be a little unfair, is, is that Theranos must be working on some kind of biological weapon. I mean, this is a list of that of a company that is probably selling something to the Defense Department. And it would been a great board for that company 25 years ago. But for a company that is working on a blood test, which is going into the conventional healthcare business, probably want people on this list to actually understand that process a little better. In fact, there are only two people on this risk on this list who have even a remote connection to healthcare. One is Bill Frist, who actually spent a lot of time away from healthcare in his role as Senate Majority Leader, and the other is Bill Foggy, who's, uh, who's, who's made some huge contributions in the eradication of smallpox, but he is 79 years old. I don't mean to be ageist, or maybe I do, but this isn't a board that's going to keep Elizabeth Holmes on her toes. And I think it was by intent because there is actually another news story that adds to my suspicion that Ms. Holmes is a control freak. About two years ago, she wrote to investors asking that they create two classes of shares. You think, so what? Lots of companies do. She wanted one class of shares to have 100 times the voting rights of the other. And of course, she was going to hold them. That's not the way you run a business as you're building it up. Now, again, I've, I've taken issue with Mark Zuckerberg for for creating voting shares at Facebook. And I have my issues with Bryn and Page at Google for doing the same. But at least you could argue they've earned the right to be corporate dictators. Miss Holmes is not quite there yet. The bottom line. So can Theranos be saved? I think it all depends on whether the technology they've developed is actually a viable technology. If it is in fact a revolutionary breakthrough and all you have are scientific problems that are getting in the way that can be fixed, then I think it can be saved, but to be saved, here's what Theranos has to do. It has to be run like a regular company, with a CEO who's a full-time CEO, who doesn't have a missionary engagement with the rest of the world. There'll be time to save the world when you get there. Bill Gates had to wait till he left Microsoft to do it. But the company also has to become a lot more transparent and a lot less opaque. It's been a very secretive organization, and it cannot afford to be secretive in the business it's in. If the technology is overhyped, there's really nothing revolutionary about it, then I think Theranos' future is much bleaker. It's going to end up as a small blood testing company, and the key word is small, which might be able to get a niche because it delivers 
delivers its findings more quickly and uses technology to deliver information rather than to test your blood. But I think we have to wait and see. But it's been an interesting exercise in looking at a company and perhaps the lesson we should all learn from this is sometimes when a story is too good to be true, it's not true. Thank you very much for listening.